Hey, what is up once more? IT Dojo, Security Plus, practice questions of the day. Colin Weaver, two questions every day. Let's go. My first question to you today is which of the following is oftentimes referred to as the art of automatic bug finding? Sounds fancy. There's your answer choices. Go ahead and give those some contemplation. When you're ready, click on play again. We can break it down. All right, the right answer choice here, uh, just getting straight to it, is fuzzing. Uh, that's what you're looking for. That is the art of automatic bug finding. Uh, fuzzing comes in a whole bunch of different flavors, but in, if I guess if I was going to really kind of make it very broad, you can have uh, very protocol aware type fuzzing and then you can just have kind of random fuzzing. But the whole idea with fuzzing is that you feed into a program or to an application or to a web app or something like that um, data that is hopefully going to cause it to behave in an unpredictable way. Now, I say hopefully if you're a developer because if you go in and fuzz your own stuff, then you can identify vulnerabilities before the bad people do. Um, but if you're an attacker, you can fuzz things in order to find a foothold that would lead to an exploit that you can then go in and take advantage of to gain control of the system. So um, fuzzing can take on a whole, again, a whole variety of different forms. For example, let's say that you're creating uh, your own PDF reader and you want to see what happens when you know your your program goes to open a PDF well it's all well and good when it opens well formed PDFs but what happens if you intentionally create malformed PDFs and then you have your PDF viewer open those files uh, what does your program do okay so um, and is it possible for you to go in and find a bug in your code in some way that it can't handle things so that's the basic idea behind fuzzing and again some fuzzing is just the idea of just sending a bunch of random crap um, into you know, uh, inputs or into a program to see what it does. And others are much more protocol aware where they understand uh, how the particular program is working and they try and manipulate it by being sort of um, uh, smart about tinkering with the protocol. Um, so those are your two different choices for that. But that's the whole idea of bug finding is to go in and, and to fuzz things. All right, next question up. There's some list of choices right there. What I want to know from you is which of them are valid IP version 6 address types? Go ahead and click on pause if you need to. Read that list when you're ready, click play. I'll tell you right now there's three correct answers. So go ahead and find those and let me know when you're ready. First answer is the correct answer, global unicast IP address. Uh, global unicast IPv6 is absolutely a valid IPv6 address type. The next guy on the list is IPX. Uh, no, that's a good old fashioned, crazy old school IPX, SPX kind of stuff. So no, not part of IP version six. Next choice is another correct choice, link local IPv6 addresses. These are the ones that you know and love. They all begin with typically FE80, even though technically they could be FE9 or FEA or even FEB, uh, but you don't really see them written that way. But FE80 is a link local IP address. It's it's actually, actually FE80 colon colon slash 10 um, is the prefix, um, but that is, if you ever see that, that's link local, and you will see that a lot because it's on every single interface there is that has IP version 6 enabled. Uh, to back up a little bit, global unicast, just to remind you if you don't already know, as of today, all globally routable unicast IPv6 addresses begin with the number 2 or the number 3. Um, that's because the base prefix as of today is 2000 double colon slash 3. Okay. And if you go mess around with the binary of that, you'll see the possible values in the first hex character is a two or a three. Next choice, wrong choice, broadcast, no. Okay, broadcast technically don't exist in IPv6 anymore. This is one of the sort of the big selling points of, ooh, IPv6. Um, they, they exist in spirit. Um, a broadcast, the functionality of what we know as a broadcast in IPv4 has simply been sucked into IPv6 multicast address space. So we can still accomplish a similar objective, um, but we no longer do it with a straight broadcast address. We now use a specialized multicast address to speak to either certain types of nodes based upon, say, a service or a function they provide, or by going in and speaking to all nodes, because uh, there is an all nodes multicast, which is very similar to the idea of what a broadcast, a broadcast address does. All right, the next answer, if any one of them confused you on this list, is because you've been around IPv6 too long, uh, which is site local IPv6 addresses. Site local addresses were used to be an address type that was valid in IPv6, but they ultimately abandoned or deprecated it 
um, and no longer make use of it because they couldn't figure out the best way to, to actually implement it. But um, so we kicked that guy to the curb. And so he might still exist in some texts. And certainly if you're Googling things on IPv6 addresses, you'll find it, but they are no longer considered valid IPv6 addresses. Next choice, unique local addresses. Unique local addresses is absolutely a valid IP version 6 address type, so this is one of your correct answers. Uh, these guys have a base prefix of FC00 colon colon slash 7. Uh, because of the way the RFC is written, there's a bit that has to be set into 1, so the actual practical implementation of them is that they will always be visually expressed as FD00, even though the base prefix is actually FC. Um, go read the RFC if you really want to get freak mode into it. But the whole idea of a unique local address, again, if you're not already familiar with them, is for you to have what is effectively a private address space that has a very high probability of being globally unique. That's assuming that you take just a few basic steps to generate the extra prefix related information to give you a high degree of assurance that you will have uniqueness. So it satisfied really the, the two sides of the table's arguments. You had one side of the table that essentially said, we still want private address space. And you had another side of the table saying, no, I'm sick of there being private address space. And the fact that there's umpteen gajillion computers in the world that have an IP address of 192.168.1.1, we don't want to deal with private address space anymore. Which also gets into deeper conversations with network address translation and things of that nature beyond the scope of this question, to say the least. But suffice to say, when somebody proposed the idea of unique local addresses, it satisfied both sides of the table. You had addresses that were technically private, yet still almost assuredly globally unique. And so both sides were like, all right, let's go. And unique local addresses were born. All right, we've already got our three right answers here, so we know that uh, we're good. But the last one on here is an NSAP address. Uh, negative. NSAP addresses are associated with ISIS or intermediate system, intermediate system, and uh, not something that really much of us come across or ever deal with anymore. So I put it in there just to distract you. So the right answer choices here again global unicast, link local, and unique local. Um, site local was that one that was a little bit confusing, but it is no longer a valid IP version 6 address, even though it once was. It's been a long time, but it once was. All right, sweet. Appreciate you being here. Two more questions down. Hope they help you as you continue your studies. Please click on the like button and absolutely click on the subscribe button. I will very much appreciate that. I do these questions every single day, so I will be back tomorrow and I'll see you then. Thanks.